Okay, so Jenny Lim uh, will um, read uh, and discuss uh, Island Poetry and History of Chinese Immigrants on Angel Island, 1910 to 1940. Uh, that book was edited by him, Mark Lai, Jenny Lim, and Judy Young. A little background on Jenny Lim. Uh, Jenny Lim is the author of five poetry collections, Winter Place, Child of War, Paper Gods and Rebels, Kra, La Morte del Tempo. Uh, she's the co-author of Island Poetry and History of Chinese Immigrants on Angel Island, which was a winner of the American Book Award. And she was also uh, involved in uh, the anthology of senior Asian American memoirs titled Windows Glimpses of Our Story Pass. Uh, Jenny is also author of the award winning play Paper Angels, <clears throat> the, first, the first Asian American play that aired on PBS's American Playhouse in 1985 and which has been produced throughout the US, Canada, and China. Um, she's also was the uh, San Francisco Jazz Poet Laureate, uh, I believe in the year 2017, okay. And next she'll be uh, introducing Island, Poetry and History of Chinese Immigrants on the Angel Island, 1910 to 1940. Uh, if you have questions uh, related to her talk, please use the, uh, the chat uh, feature, which is on the bottom here. And we'll, we'll be taking questions at the end of her talk, okay? So without further ado, uh, Jenny. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak with your class and uh, to members of the community at 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, it's an honor to do this because um, now that I'm retired, I don't have a, a, a congregate class to teach anymore. So uh, it's very important for me to stay in touch with uh, the people on the ground, the students who are undergoing distance learning and during the pandemic. And I just heard this morning that there was another attack on an uh, Asian man. I don't know if you saw the news, but um, an Asian American man was going to the bank and he was again knocked down and robbed, knocked to the ground. I don't know his condition. It was in San Leandro. And um, uh, according to the news report, he was missing. He was robbed of thousands of dollars. So these have become almost everyday occurrences. And I, I speak of it because it's uh, fundamentally related to the whole reason why Judy Young, him, Mark Lai, and I were so committed to preserving the history of the Chinese who were detained on Angel Island. As you all know that it was done under the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, and it was not lifted until 1943, but in, within those years, they kept reinforcing the laws to make it even harder for the Chinese to enter. And in 1917, February 5th, 1917, they passed the Immigration Act, which uh, designated Chinese and all nine non-whites actually as undesirables, uh, undesirables to enter into the US. So this law banned um, Asiatics from entering to the US from any Asian countries. And it included the Mexicans, Indians, and non-Caucasian immigrants. So we have a long history of um, anti-Asian, Sinophobic um, attitudes towards us in this country. And um, it is all re-emerged again under the Ch uh, China, China virus, uh, so-called by uh, Trump and the gung flu and all those kinds of nasty jokes that have only perpetuated a, a lot of the 
racial violence against us in our communities, not just in the US, but around the world. They are experiencing, uh, Asians are experiencing violence in Europe and elsewhere. So when we, uh, the, our first edition of Island, the one you saw the cover, that's the third edition. This was the first one and we self-published it under the acronym Hak Doi, History of Chinese Detained on Island, which is Hak Doi is the term if you're um, old, old timers and speak my dialect, which is the Sayup dialogue, dialect, Toisan, Toisanese, which uh, a great many of the immigrants coming into the US at that time from China spoke. And the, the, that dialect is very difficult for a lot of people to learn unless they're born into it, has a lot of, has more um, ascending, descending accents than the regular Cantonese, which also has more um, inflections and ascending tones, more tones than Mandarin. It's a lot of fleyip, fleyip wa, you know, we say gong hei fa toy instead of gong hei fa toy. Bok choy. But anyway, so that's where the term hak doi came from. And the reason why we self-published was because we could not get any publishers, not even the university presses at that time, interested. And we were told that um, by the publishers that they don't um, handle foreign language books because we wanted to publish the uh, poetry in both the I'll show you. In the Chinese, alongside the English, because it was very important to us to make it accessible to um, our Chinese parents who didn't read English, as well as the American born Chinese. So that was the, the target community. And how the poems came to be was that they were discovered around the in 19 uh, around 1960s late 1960s 19 um officially it was 1970 but it was there before in a park ranger by the name of alexander weiss who was stationed in angel island went into this old dilapidated barracks and saw these chinese carvings and writings on the wall in chinese calligraphy and he said, this is very curious. So uh, it's just so happened that Alexander Weiss was taking a course, Asian American studies course from George Araki in, at San Francisco State. So uh, uh, George Araki said, hmm, I wonder what those poems are about. And so he sent a photographer, Mak Takahashi, to the barracks, the immigration, old immigration detention barracks. I don't know how many of you have been there, but um, it's available for tours, <clears throat> excuse me. And so Mak Takahashi went there and photographed every inch of the walls in the barracks where he saw uh, writing. Some of them was, were written in ink and some of them were carved. Excuse me, I have morning allergies. But um, so this first edition, Island, was self published. And uh, at that time, there was a bilingual Chinese English newspaper called East West Journal. And it was published by Gordon Lau, who um, was also a minister. And he taught English, uh, taught Chinese to American born. And he had this clever way of putting um, a character in every paper. Every day he would focus on a different Chinese character and he would show the origin of that char uh, character in calligraphy and then the, you know, the full modern uh, character. And um, so that you would understand the origins, the etymology of that character. And so he, he did that. But he was very dedicated to preserving the Chinese uh, history in, in um, the US. And at that time, Judy Young, who passed away just very recently this last year in December, 
um, she was the editor of the East West newspaper and him, Mark Lai, who is uh, the second co-author of Island was a Bechtel engineer. And he was doing his own lay, uh, his history of Chinese American, the uh, basically the history of the Chinese American diaspora throughout the world. Every Chinatown, every Chinese uh, community in the world was uh, interesting to him. And he researched all of that, but particularly focusing on Chinese American history in the US. So he was publishing his articles, researching um, Chinese Americans at, at, at East West. Judy was um, the editor and I had just returned from a stint uh, in New York where I had lived for six years and was um, uh, doing some volunteer reporting for Bridge Magazine in, in New York City. And um, I had come back to San Francisco. I had also worked for CBS News at the time as a broadcast journalist. And uh, so my natural instinct was to, you know, go to the East West and try to, you know, volunteer to do some community um, reporting for them. So when the story broke about the poems on Angel Island, um, I guess Judy and uh, Mark had the idea that we should, you know, try to get out there and, and publish all those poems in the newspaper. And he would translate them. But the problem was uh, uh, him, Mark said, well, I'm not a poem poet, so I can translate them uh, literally, but it's not going to sound like anything because I'm not a poet. So Judy knew me and said, well, Jenny's a poet. So that's how it came about. And then um, we went to the island and we, you know, we had all the poems that we could find there. And it just so happened that Judy was also the librarian at the first Asian community library in Oakland. So she was truly a pioneer and um, different old timers would go up to her and talk to her. And two of these um, old gentlemen, Tet Yi and Smiley Jan, happened to be former detainees on Angel Island. And so uh, Smiley told um, Judy, uh, you know, I, uh, I got the poems, you know, in a notebook. And when I, and she said, really, how did you, you get the poems? He goes, well, when I stayed there, I copied them all down in my notebook. And, and for some reason, they had the wherewithal, the wisdom to realize that these poems were going to be an, an important document of their existence as prisoners on Angel Island. And so if, if it wasn't for them, we, there would not have been the book because they were the ones, the, the, the first ones to, give us enough so that we could publish in, in one volume. And so we took the poems from um, both Ted Yi, who happened to be an interpreter um, at the island, and um, he, uh, he copied them down. And uh, we had both those collections. And then as uh, along with the Maktakahashi photos and what we could see, and uh, we came up with these poems. So uh, I will read a couple of them to you to give you a sense of what was on their minds. What was their experience on Angel Island? Leaving, my, leaving behind my writing brush and removing my sword, I came to America. Who is to know two streams of tears would flow upon arriving here. If there comes a day when I will have attained my ambition and become successful, I will certainly behead the barbarians and spare not a single blade of grass. You see the anguish in this um, detainee. So it really flies in the face of the model minority myth, right? that the Chinese came here and um, 
you know, we're happy to be at the service of, you know, uh, the dominant white culture. Now, this one is, is very angry about um, what he perceived was an unjust um, detainment. And this one, um, this one is the one that is um, most, can you see? Uh, that's the best preserved one. It's beautifully carved. And um, it's in a, a, a small room that's outside of the dormitory. The big dormitory has, if you haven't been there, um, all that's left there are the poles and then they have a standing uh, exhibit there uh, to simulate um, what it was. And they, well, that was, but now that they've re renovated the whole place, they've actually returned the three tiered berths. So, so to simulate what it was like then. But when we were first there, there was nothing there, just the poles when we first uh, entered. So this poet um, makes a reference to a, a Chinese general, Zhu, who uh, fought foreigners um, from the Xinjiang area who invaded and um, uh, took over China. So this general was so committed to fighting off the barbarians that um, the poet uh, uses him, him as an example. Detained in this wooden house for several tens of days. It is all because of the Mexican exclusion law, which implicates me. It's a pity heroes have no way of exercising their prowess. I can only wait for the words so that I can snap Joe's whip. From now on, I am departing far from this building. All of my fellow villagers are rejoicing with me. Now don't say that everything within is Western styled. Even if it is built of jade, it has turned into a cage. You see the paradox of, um, you know, the, the promise of Gamsan, Gold Mountain, or Gimsan in my dialect. Um, they're drawn to this fantasy of this beautiful place with opportunities to lift themselves from poverty and uh, conflicts, wars at home. But what happens is when they come, they wind up in this wooden cage and some of them don't even land. Uh, some of them are deported and some of them are um, there for several months before they can land. And in 1917, there was a graft uh, discovered that a lot of the immigration authorities were on the take. And so they were landing um, the detainees who uh, you know, had given the money and those that didn't have a cent would get stuck there for God knows how long. So it really, um, the whole setup with the laws, the immigration that it could be undermined that way really gave pause into the whole um, merit and, and uh, equity of the whole system. And there were food riots too. So it wasn't like, um, the Chinese just, you know, took it standing still. And then um, in San Francisco Chinatown, the Chinese six companies and uh, every family association, um, they were organized and they constantly fought against the Chinese Exclusion Act um, because it was a law that only targeted the Chinese. And there had never been a law that explicitly targeted any racial uh, uh, ethnic group except the 1882 Exclusion Act. So why this history is so important is that um, a lot of this is kind of re-emerging again. And all it took was uh, Trump to lift the lid on the Pandora's box to unleash all of the 
resentment that you know the a lot of these are working class whites to so the same type that you would find around the time of the exclusion act under Dennis Kearney, who blamed all the Chinese for taking away their jobs. And it was the same thing, but what the Chinese did was they did all the, you know, the, the hard work, the menial work, you know, working in the farms, you know, bending over and picking artichokes, things like that, dredging the swamp land working um good hundreds of chinese laborers were the ones that if you go to the christian brothers they're the ones that you know um, dug up all of that uh, where you see they keep the wine that was all dug up by the chinese so um yeah same like today it's the mexicans that have been you know doing all of the field work and uh, those are not the jobs that white, whites want to take and then I'll read um, one more and then maybe entertain some questions you might have. Okay. There are tens of thousands of poems composed on these walls. They are all cries of complaint and sadness. The day I'm rid of this prison and attain success, I must remember that this chapter once existed in my daily needs, I must be frugal. Needless extravagance leads youth to ruin. All my compatriots should please be mindful. Once you have some small gains, return home early. By one from uh, Shang Shan. I don't know, uh, that's a Mandarin. Um, uh, spelling. But what I want to also say before I open it up to questions is that all these poems were written by um, teenagers. These, they were not adults because by and large, the average age of the immigrants coming in from China, and most of them were coming from around the South, uh, the Toisan, Samyup district areas. They were like 13, 14, 15, and 16, let me show you a picture I have. Um, let's see if I could find that. So, um, but, and most of them only had like elementary edu uh, school education. They were not college graduates, even high school graduates. But this boy, he looks to be like what, 14, no more than 15 and, um, here were the women. Unfortunately, there were no uh, poems that were preserved from the women. Um, some of our de uh, the former detainees uh, said that they saw poems that women did write, but they were painted over and none of them uh, used carving instruments to preserve them. And also there were a much more scanty number of them because the Chinese women weren't even educated, even um, some of them did not go to these boys are. And these are the, 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 the boys that are writing these poignant, beautiful poems, but the education system in, in China was, um, you know, more, um, I would say advanced for the level because they were learning um, poetry, yet as a formal style of classical poetry. So, you know that that uh, that was re very very uh, impressive. Okay, let me see. Hmm difference in treatment between those on Angel Island versus Ellis Island? Oh, good question. Um, uh, the, the Europeans who are coming to the US from Ellis Island did not undergo nearly as much uh, discrimination and, or hardship as the Chinese who came to Angel Island one, because there was not an exclusion act 
passed against Europeans. There was a quota and the Europeans had, a, I don't know what it was, a much higher quota to enter than the, than the Chinese, you know. Um, and the Chinese could only enter if they were from exempt classes. They could not enter if they were coming in as menial laborers. They had to come in as students, merchants, or, um, the, or diplomats. And that's why the whole paper uh, sun system developed because we know that the um, dominant, the predominant um, occupation of the uh, detainees, they were so young, they're like 15, 16, that they, the best they could do was be farmers, laborers. And so they had a system, the paper sun system, where they assume the identity of someone else um, who was a merchant. So most of them were coming in as merchants or some, a few students, but by and large as uh, businessmen. And so the hearings would uh, go on to test them on the merits of their uh, truthfulness. So you had, if you were assuming someone else's identity, you had to memorize their entire biography, who their parents were, who their kids were, and, and even they had um, blueprints of your village. And they would ask you detailed questions like, where's your house? But then they got so technical, they would ask things like, you know, um, where's your rice been located? Something that is a movable object or how many uh, dogs do you own? And that's why my play, uh, I have a simulated interrogation um, session where the old man says uh, uh, one or something and uh, and the, the guy says no you you know there are, you know you had two, uh, two dogs or something because oh I ate one you know <laughs> because they, it got so absurd that they they were like grasping straws trying to trip up the um, inmates but some of them were I uh, we interviewed one man who was more compassionate so there was a kind of a range and then there were others that had reputations for being really hard-nosed and, and really, you know, determined to trip you up. So, um, okay, let's see, how did the, um, let me see that question. No, it wasn't, it was open up to, they had um, a quota, but as I said, I have to look up the, what their quota was for entering. Of course, they couldn't enter if they were prisoners or had something like that, but um, let's see. I suspect that many of those teenagers on Angel Island were paper sons. I know my father was one of them and he came over as a paper son as did a lot of people in his generation. True, Jennifer, um, a lot of them um, actually went and changed their names back to their original uh, real names. But, um, but then that during the confession program, but a lot of, um, of the uh, former Chinese detainees didn't trust the system because they knew that, and my father was one that um, didn't trust the system, but he was actually a limb, so he didn't have to change his name. Although my grandfather was like going back and forth and bringing over uh, paper sons. So he, he brought a lot of people over and then on, on, he ended up getting deported one time. And then my uh, father was stuck here as a young boy with no parents. So, you know, he, he was very uh, bitter about that being abandoned in the US. Uh, yeah. Jennifer's father, uh, uh, Jennifer says, my father changed his name, but he was working for the postal service at the time and it cost him his job. Yes, exactly, that's what I'm saying. My father didn't trust that because yeah, there was, um, the government was not to be trusted. You know, the, are there still records of the people process? Oh yes, you should go to San Bruno um, archives, National Archives, and you could look up 
um, I did, and I found out a, I was able to even get the, the transcripts, copies of the transcripts of my um, father's and grandfather's interrogation hearings. And they're really interesting, the kind of questions they'll ask, um, oh, does your wife have bound feet, you know, how many kids, you know, uh, does she have, does she have a birthmark, you know, on her face, you know, all, uh, all kinds of questions like that. And um, so I have one, um, uh, I have uh, actually about three or four of them for different um, people, not just my father. So I was like uh, trying to figure out the mystery of all these transcripts. And I assumed that they were transcripts of relatives that my, my grandfather had brought over. But because my grandfather um, brought over other clan members, he gave up the opportunity for um, my, my, my uh, sisters to enter. I mean, my he made my father, you know, he declared um, the, the grand, the daughters so that they couldn't come over until wait many years later. They would sell a female slot to to a prospective male male buyer that matched the same age, yeah. So it really kind of um, created a lot of turmoil and separation in in people's families. Um, what intergenerational trauma was caused, and how did um, the Angel Island movement become a catharsis for the community? Yeah. Um, it, that was one of the traumas was that uh, children, classmates I went to school with uh, found out that their names were not, you know, like Dong or that they were actually Yi's and not Fong's. And, and then one day they would come to school with the, their names changed and they go, what, what's up with that, you know? And uh, with that, you know, that created a lot of con uh, confusion about identity because you say, well, then if um, I'm not a Fong, then who, who are, what is my genealogy? Who are my real grandparents, you know? And where did they come from? You know, I thought we were from Shandong and it to actually turns out that we were from Toisan, you know, and on and on and on. And um, yeah, and the confessional program complicated things even further because the half the community was so paranoid. I know even interviewing my mother caused a, a fury in my family. My father, you know, was really um, freaked out that we were doing this book and that we were exposing everyone's identities and everybody's stories because uh, he was really mistrustful of the U.S. government, you know, um, even though he voted later on, but um, he did not trust at all. He said, you know, you never know, they can just swoop us up. In fact, they called the uh, police look ye because the immigration authorities wore green and they were known to come into the communities and do sweeps of what they called you know the Ill illegals and um, uh, deport them that they did that so he was always uh, fearful of that day one day they would knock on our door and then when we were bad my um, mother would say look ye jok ne huila the, 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 green, the green people are gonna come and get you if you don't behave. So that, that persisted for a long time with the old timers. And I always thought that um, they were so, um, I thought they were apathetic, apolitical and indifferent and didn't wanna engage with the mainstream society because they're just too, um, you know, into, you know, just too antisocial, but there was a reason for their antisocialism. It was because they had uh, memories of those days when you couldn't even leave Chinatown without being pelted or stoned. 
um, even when I was growing up, we were one of the first uh, Chinese families to live in North Beach Chinatown. And uh, when we went to school, um, we had go to Fran uh, I had to walk to Francisco Junior High School, it was then. And on the way back, we had to uh, pass St. Peter and Paul's parochial school. And every time they would, you know, uh, yell racial epithets at us and throw, you know, rocks and things. So, and our neighbors were Italian. And um, one day um, they threw a pitcher of water and dropped, poured it on me when I was playing in the alley. <laughs> And and, it, and I ran home crying, and then my sisters came to defend me and started banging on their door, and um, then the, the the it was this whole thing. And the grandmother came, said she was going to call the police. <laughs> so yeah, no, it, uh, racism has always been with us, and and with the Southern Italian immigrants, they pitted we were pitted against each other because we're all the working class immigrants. And then um, that's what happened. Like even now with the, the Blacks suffering from the pandemic, what do they do? They go for the easy target, old men and women, helpless old men and women, you know, and steal their money, not, uh, you know, just even knocking them down just for the hell of it. So there's all this um, kind of uh, fear, paranoia and blame. And um, once again, were scapegoated, just as we were scapegoated during those exclusion years. And um, I think education is uh, um, the factor and these kinds of, that's why ethnic studies was created to address that kind of uh, stereotyping, racial profiling, and it's all based on uh, paranoia, deflection, and uh, it's all instigated by someone that wants to, some entity that benefits from dividing and conquering us. And we're so busy hating each other, we don't go after the corporations, right? Um, that are really making billions hands over fist during the pandemic. We're too busy, you know, blaming the Chinese, you know, or whoever. So let me go on. Um, okay. How do you think the younger generation can preserve the emotional ch uh, charge behind the narratives of our parents and ancestors, given our differences in experience? Good question. I think um, for me, it was really difficult to um, tr transform the thinking of my parents uh, who were ironically staunch Republicans. <laughs> they voted for, you know, they liked Goldwater and they liked, you know, Eisenhower was the one, you know, they loved Eisenhower. Um, they were very, very conservative in their political biases and beliefs. And uh, they were very fearful of blacks. Uh, when my uh, sister married um, uh, African-American, um, is very light-skinned and, you know, Creole, but, never, but no, nonetheless, he was African-American. Oh, that was like unheard of, you know, this was really back in the, 70s so you didn't do that sort of thing and uh and my father just said i'll never be able to hold my head up in chinatown again that's how difficult it was for him to accept um interracial you know uh, interracial marriage in his own family and uh, she suffered greatly because of that and the, during the uh, Chinese dinner, um, she had to sit separately from the family <laughs> with her daughter. Yeah, so um, maybe there wasn't enough room at the table, but you know, still and all. So I would take my my bowl and go sit with her. So it's really difficult to deal with that kind of um, 
prejudice. And um, to change the narrative, um, you know, you can only do so much until um, they have to grapple with it themselves and uh, embrace it themselves and come to terms with their own fears and racism. But if you keep try to uh, please them, you're going to lose sight of your own um, soul and your own life and your own goals. So uh, that's the whole intergenerational conflict and generation gap. Uh, you have to tell them like, look, you know, they may not listen. This is look at the things that they did that their parents would not approve of, you know, and, and say this, you had your time and you made your choices and your decisions. And I, you know, it's not my fault that you immigrated here, but because you did, I'm living in a totally different world than the world you lived in. So I have to come to terms with my decisions and my choices. And if I make the wrong decisions and choices, you know, be on, you know, it would be my responsibility to deal with it. As long as you can prove to them that you're prepared to accept the responsibilities of your decisions and choices, I think they, you know, they can expect more from you and they shouldn't. And um, that's what I used to tell my mother and she would love you. <laughs> she, didn't, she, she didn't go for it, but I think ultimately she respected me and my father did because I, I was like a real renegade. I was singing in a rap, rock band in the 60s. The only um, Asian uh, lead singer in a rock band called Glass Mountain. And, um, and um, my, they, my, they, my father actually enjoyed it. And we, we performed in a queer bar called the Two Box toolbox on fourth and harrison and my father would come in a suit and sit at the bar and where all these gays were dancing and he would i said what are you doing here dad and he goes what 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 am i doing here? i'm doing what everyone else is doing enjoying the music and he he kind of liked that i was you know a rebel so um they do change you yeah, know they do change you know um, especially if you, uh, you know, chart your own way and you succeed in what you're doing, that then they are, they'll, what they're afraid of is that you will be defeated, you will lose because they love, love us so much that they don't want to make choices that will ruin our lives. And for my father, what he feared most was that my daughter was going to make a choice that would ruin her life, that she would become um, a pariah in the community and he, because there was so much prejudice. And that's really the real reason why he resented her um, marrying, because Chinatown was everything to him. You know, he never wanted to leave. He go to the Gong Sa, the uh, Lim Family Association every day. Those were his people, you know. But um, so he wanted, he needed that acceptance from his peers. But um, it's a different world, and, and they they have to accept that at some point. Let's see. Any? Um, I don't know. Any more questions? I didn't see anything in the chats. Um, oh, were many like, here? There's one here. Oh, the, uh, uh, Harvey had one. There were poems using the phrase laws harsh as tigers. Oh, yeah. They're talking about, you know, the unfair um, immigration laws. They don't, they, they're not dumb. They know that it's a racist law. And that's why the, um, the family associations and Chinese six companies wrote editorials in the papers and the Chinese papers talking about how racist the exclusion laws were. Um, the tigers, you know, they're harsh, they're, they're vicious. So, and they're predatory. That's how they saw these laws. That's why they, you know, that immigrant, uh, he wasn't the only one that said he wanted to behead the 
you know, the barbarians and their, you know, laws. Okay, uh, let's see. One, four new messages. Okay. Do you have any histories of the individual Angel Island Cone writers? You know, they all signed anonymously. They would just say one from Toy San, one from Jung San. Um, I think there was only one that uh, actually put his name down, but we were never able to, you know, most of them have probably passed away um, by now. So it was unfortunate. Yeah, we, it would have been wonderful if we could interview one of the poets. Hmm. What is the total number of writings and how many of those are in your book? Okay, this one, uh, there, when they peeled off, they did a whole restoration project at the detention barracks. And it was a very, very, uh, very meticulous and, and difficult, complicated job of peeling off several layers of paint over the years there were different administrations that painted over the, the the surfaces so they had to there's a method by which they can peel off the paint and so we were able to get some extra um, poems in this book there's like you know probably i would say about um, maybe almost there were probably over around 200 poems. I don't know exactly how many we, I forget, uh, 100 and we have, um, some of them actually we, we didn't preserve because we thought they were kind of graffiti. But if you include all the graffiti and everything, I would say there were 200 poems, but we, we have like 135 here that we thought, you know, were, um, not like incomplete. Some of them were like some phrases or couplets and you know, and that was that. So these were the, the most uh, realized poems, 135 of them. And this one, we also included uh, poems from, they were Chinese that entered to Ellis Island as well. So we have some, not that many, but a few. And then we have some from uh, Canada, Victoria Island. Uh, British Columbia that were was preserved and um, yeah so that's why the book is much thicker but the bulk of the uh, Chinese came through Angel Island uh, what is the, any conclusion comments regarding the relevance and importance of the poems um, as I was saying these poems are a testimony to the thoughts sensibilities and experience of the Chinese entering the U.S. at this particular time in U.S. history between 1910 and 1940. So you can't get more authentic than their true voices. So we can't, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, rewriting, often revisionist history. There's a lot of this, um, the, around the time I was, you know, growing up in the 60s, 70s, they were always talking, you holding up the Asians as the model minority. Why can't the Mexicans, why can't the Blacks be like the Asians? And we were the obedient ones in the school system. The teachers always wanted to work in Chinatown because the Chinese were so, such obedient, good model students. So when you read these poems, you would say, these, that's not the people who we were. We only became model minorities out of the necessity to survive in a racist environment. What's the best way to survive? By following the rules. And, and one time, um, James Hong, the famous uh, cameraman, who, uh, James Howe, I mean, who, um, did the cinematography for HUD and um, was that pool movie with Paul Newman? I can't remember, but he was an Academy Award win winning cameraman. And we had a banquet to honor him one time. And he said to us, 
um, young youngsters at the table. He said, you have to be better than they are at their own game. That's, that was his key. And so that was the whole model minority thing. We have to be better at their game than they were in order to be accepted into the club. But today with the, you know, the, the uh, self-determination and um, affirmative action and, you know, uh, and, and self-empowerment, we don't have to compete against them. I think we have to change the narrative to being the best of who we are. We don't have to be the best white person. You know, we don't have to be Clarence Thomas's, you know, to get to the su Supreme Court. We have to honor and have the moral integrity to be true to our histories, be true to our parents and our you know, ancestors and, and to ourselves and our dreams. The American dream is to be able to realize your own personal goals of what you want in your life. And um, that's all I have to, <laughs> to offer. <laughs> Thank you. Who have, oh, someone else was a paper boy who entered through Angel Island and this class is helping me figure out. Yeah, go to um, the San Bruno National Archives is really close by. You could go online and look it up. You can make an appointment and they, they, they can help you, you know, track down your, uh, you know, genealogy that way through finding out how, how your, you know, ancestors entered. And then there's Ellis Island too. Um, I actually, at one point during the uh, whole thing of the Angel Island preserving the history went went to the National Archives in uh, D.C. They don't let you take anything out of there, but you they you can like some things you you could photocopy. Um, so that was really interesting. It'd be and now with the pandemic, you can't you can probably get a lot of those things um, through the yeah the website. So it's well worth the hunt. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time and attention and to Harvey and uh, all the sponsors of this, uh, his series for allowing me to uh, share with you some of my thoughts on uh, Angel Island history and uh, its relevance to what's happening here today on the ground. Uh, good luck to you all and uh, prevail, you know, truth prevails. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for, for your presentation. Um, You're welcome, Harvey. Yeah, the poetry was actually a voice of a generation that was actually my grandpa's generation, but it had deep influences on um, on my generation because we we would not have known how people thought and how they resisted if if that. Uh, if those poems were not preserved, you know, so just imagine, you know, the power of words and poetry is very important for us today. Okay. Um, it has a lot to do with the theme of resistance, you know, cultural resistance. And thank you for uh, uh, publishing uh, Island. Okay. Uh, next week, uh, we'll have uh, Bruce Kwan, uh, who will talk about uh, five generations of his family, uh, who was actually his great grandfather uh, <clears throat> was active in the building of uh, Oakland Chinatown after the uh, uh, 1906 earthquake and fire. So uh, it's the same Zoom address, same time next Wednesday. So we'll see you all then. Okay. Bye. <laughs>